Welcome back to another episode of the How I Quit Alcohol podcast. For first time listeners, please be aware that not all of the conversations within this podcast are suitable for children. I'd also like to add a trigger warning that sometimes the conversations can get a little heavy. We may talk about things like sexual abuse, domestic violence, drug use and alcohol use. And if you feel that that may trigger you, please do not tune in. Also, I'd like to add, if you are a heavy daily drinker, please seek the help of a medical practitioner before quitting alcohol. This podcast comes to you from beautiful Bunjalung country. Please kick back and enjoy. Grab yourself your favorite alcohol-free bevy. And if you haven't already, do a gal a favor. Please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Hi, and welcome back to How I Quit Alcohol. Today in the Zoom room, I'm super stoked to be joined by this magnificent beast of a human. His name is Drew Wild. He is doing awesome things in the sober space. He is an addiction and codependency coach, trauma-informed, which I love. And he's got some exciting things coming up, which we're going to talk about today on the podcast. But I would just also love to hear your story and what you're all about, Drew. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Honor and a privilege to be here. It's so nice to actually finally connect. I know that we've been sort of connected vicariously on social media for a few years now that we've never actually met. It's kind of like we've been dating but don't really know each other. It's sort of like this kind of it's, <laughs> actually I won't even go there where I was gonna go there with that. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I'm taking that back. Yeah. <laughs> Edit cut <laughs> go again. <laughs> no way I'm leaving that in. Um, Raw, yeah. real and unfiltered. No, that's what I like. <laughs> Yeah, look, me, who I am about my journey, I guess, you know, Drew Wild. Yeah, obviously my, my story, my journey is one of one of addiction. When did you start drinking? Uh, drinking, I would say, I don't know when I probably got like wasted for the first time, but it would have been young, like what, 10 or 11, maybe. 10 or 11, that is young. Yeah, I started smoking weed even before that. What? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was like, I think I was, I would say, I want to say 10 when I first smoked weed. How'd you get your hands on it? I found my dad's stash. Mm. Yeah. So my dad was very like high up in, in the corporate world. And I think that that was just like, you know, a high stress job, other contributing factors to his life that would have created a, an environment of stress. And I think that that was just his coping mechanism. That's what, you know, he didn't smoke a lot and he didn't smoke in front of me. But there, I could, there's nights where I can look back and remember that smell like coming under the door, you know, <laughs> like, oh, okay. Oh, that's what that was. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. what that is. And that was just this way to kind of kick back and unwind after an extremely, I could only imagine, stressful week. It's interesting, isn't it? Like having that stuff in the house and being around that. I know that I used to go and mm. a couple of things, like go into my parents' bar and just pour little snippets, like little tiny bits of vermouth or something gross. Yeah, something and super rank. Eh? Like con- contro or something. Like <laughs> But my mum did have creme de menthe and I used to like love that because it's a pepperminty oh, cocktail. God. And I remember yeah. my friend Lyndall Hunt, who's regular on this podcast, her and I would get into the creme de menthe and would sneak around. And even with the cigarettes, like I remember like cutting around the, the – because they'd have the carton of the cigarettes and then yeah. opening it and then like getting one from the back and then shuffling it and closing it and yeah. puff, puff, puff. Fuck, <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. That's so funny. It's- all these things you do yeah my parents are smokers as well like they they stopped Mm -hmm. but yeah like it was just it was so normal it was so common especially at that you know that era that that generation you know a lot of people smoke smoke cigarettes yeah Yeah, sneaking sneaking ciggies sneaking alcohol sneaking yeah sneaking weed in this case i didn't even really know what it was i think it was my cousin knew what it was he was a few years older than me and we were out at, we call it a batch in new zealand i grew up in new zealand but like a, a beach house or sort of something like that and my dad, whenever we'd go on a holiday, would take, he had this little like a glasses case. And in the glasses case, it wasn't glasses, it was a little bag of weed and this little silver pipe and some papers. And my cousin knew exactly what it was. And I remember smoking it with him. But yeah, you know, like even from back then, I remember smoking for the first time. I remember drinking for the first time. And I remember this just, like profound sense of relief in my system, this profound sense of like, oh like this calm this stillness this this relaxation this just this discomfort within my own body had disappeared and I was like wow obviously I wasn't making these connections back at 11 years old but I was like wow interesting that made me feel good and so that was what the brain was interesting yeah but even before that like I could clock and looking back on how much 
just even escape, escapism there was in my, just as a child, I was an only child as well. And I felt that almost like that discomfort, that irritability in my system from a very, very, very young age. Can I ask you, where do you feel, and you don't have to share, but where do you feel that discomfort came from? Where did that stem from? I know from? exactly where it came from. Um, it took me a, a many years to, to, to figure this out. <laughs> as you know, you know, the journey's mm-hmm. like, it took me, you know, just get sober first, start peeling back the layers, start really digging deep. And what I realized and recognized was, and I can expand on this further down the podcast, but my mum was 40 years old when she had me. She'd had two miscarriages before me. So even in utero, when she was pregnant with me, what I was feeling was was a lot of deep-seated fear from her end, a lot of mm. fear, a lot of terror, just scared, anxiety, anxious, anxious of, of losing another baby. Like, you know, she's feeling, this is my last chance. This is my last opportunity. If I don't have a baby now, I'll never have one type experiences. Mm. I also know she was in a different city to a lot of her family. So she just felt very unsupported, new mum, yada, 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 unregulated nervous system dysregulated um, stress in her life and again I can expand on this later and I'm sure you've had many people talk about this in your podcast but in that period of, of our lives up until almost seven years old we can't regulate our own nervous systems we're regulating off our mother's nervous system so I'm feeling all that I'm feeling this is even before I came out into the world I'm feeling all this stress all this angst all this fear all this you know, I'm taking on board a lot of her energy so my nervous system was just mirroring hers and I, was, I think I was born a couple of days late as well, which didn't surprise me. I was like, fuck that. Why would I want to come out into that world? Mm-hmm. That feels like a scary place to be and exist. So, yeah, what I also felt and experienced, and again, this, this took a lot of work to get to this place and, and you know, working with some incredible teachers and mentors that I have in my life now. But what I also realized and recognized was this kind of undercurrent and this feeling that I always got from my mom was, I like I need you it was kind of this narrative that I was picking up on unconsciously again all of this is completely unconscious there was no conscious thought to this on her side or my side that there was a this, this unconscious sort of like emission of like I need I need you I need you to survive I need you to be x y and z and so my experience of that as a kid growing up was literally the definition of conditional love Mm. so the story i made that mean was that i had to be x y and z in order to receive Mm. the love that i wanted yeah so yeah even from a super super young age i I was i felt that dysregulation in my nervous system i felt that discomfort in my nervous system like i was just fully attuned to what she was experiencing at the time which makes sense you know you've got kids yeah yeah, I've got yeah kids. you've got kids so yeah I mean I can only imagine what it must be like as a mum like that first kid as well especially not really knowing what you're in for potentially not having the support you feel like you really would like or, or deserve and wanting just to get it right yeah 100 percent. it's interesting uh, what we pick up in utero it's a really interesting conversation to have on her gobble mate talks about that a lot in the book in the realm of hungry ghosts he touches on that what we pick up when we're in the womb and that pre-verbal stuff that we pick up on and our nervous systems and then how that can then have an effect on the way our brain works, the way our brain absorbs and takes up dopamine. It's really interesting stuff. I find it fascinating. He expands mm. a lot more on it in his new book, The Myth of Normal. Myth he of goes normal. a lot more into pregnancy and, mm. and particularly Western birthing practices as well. And, yeah, again, like this was way down the track of my journey of, of recovery. You know, <laughs> it takes a long time to get there, but that's 100%. part of this beautiful process is the peeling back of the layers exactly. and going, wow, I know in doing the compassion inquiry course with Gabor, it was amazing. Like this whole year dedicated to learning how to peel back other people's layers, but also even peeling back my own layers. And it was just so transformative and also being able to see where this stuff comes from and the core beliefs that we've got about ourselves, where that authenticity over attachment and I think it's the core of everything. Like I, I genuinely, it's the core of every single human on this planet. Yeah. That's where my work is probably more like broad spectrum in, in that sense. Like, yes, yes like same. my front facing shop on my Instagram, if you came and looked at my Instagram would be the addiction guy, very well known for the work that I've done in the, 
addiction space, the reality is most of my one-on-one clients, I don't know where they come from. I don't know where they turn up from. I do know part of what they resonate with. But I'd say 85% of them are women that are just, they've either come out of or are looking for support in coming out of like quite a codependent relationship or quite a toxic relationship. I've got a few mm. friends that often make jokes that I should be a feminine embodiment coach or that I should be a divorce concierge or something along <laughs> those lines. <laughs> and yes. It's work that I love, but this is what I start to realize and recognize and obviously put the pieces together as I've gone down this journey myself, that we're all impacted by what I call attachment contortions or attachment trauma or developmental trauma. Every single human on this planet. And I I genuinely believe that actually 90 to 95% of the trauma or the undigested life experiences or the emotional imprints or the, you know, the imprints of the past that never got processed, or just other ways to say trauma, because again, trauma has a, a pretty deep stigma attached to it these days as well mm-hmm. in the healing space, and it's quite misunderstood. 90 to 95% of the, of the trauma that I work with is developmental trauma. Mm-hmm. Same, I would say so. Yeah, and I often say to people, you know, I'm like, I, the truth is, and the reality is, I, it, sometimes I'd prefer to be working with acute trauma. It's easier. It's, yes. it's a lot easier. You've got a very distinctive event that you can work with. You've got mm-hmm. a very distinctive time stamp where that imprint was, was marked in the body. And mm-hmm. maybe potentially, whether there's memory or not, there's definitely some extreme sensory responses that we can work with as well. Whereas developmental trauma is really just not getting our, our needs met in the way that we wanted them met as a kid or we needed them met as a kid. A lot of this is, is varying forms of emotional neglect or what's so common is this belief that we, we have to be something other than who we just truly are in order to create or receive some sort of sense of love and or safety in our lives. And again, so in these moments, we just keep contorting further and further and further and further away mm. from who we were always meant to be. Which makes sense. Like, it's fucking incredible. This is what the human body does. I find this stuff so fascinating. I think you, you would know this. Gabe says it all the time. Like, if a, if a child's given the choice of attachment or authenticity, that child's always going to choose attachment because that means love. That means survival. That means that they will live. I genuinely believe that this, you know, most people on this planet, who they think they are or who they think their identity is, it's just a myriad and a makeup of, of so many different conditioned experience throughout their life that yeah. they've decided they've had to be or become in order to fit in, belong, find love, create safety and survive. Yeah. And it's not until we really start doing a lot of this work that we're like, oh, fuck, shit, okay, yeah. that's not me at all. <laughs> that's just a part of me. Yeah, it's a very, uh, last night in my, in my group challenge, we did a compassionate inquiry, Stepping Stones group call. It was beautiful and getting to those core beliefs. And it's amazing. Oh, that's probably my favorite call that we all do together because that's where you get to the kind of nitty gritties. And it sounds scary, but it's not like for most people that are going through that. And for some people, it, it's a lot, but it's like, it's there's this moment of, hmm, like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. I now I understand. Oh, it's not that I'm a bad person or I'm weak or that it's just that this core belief I've had has been driving me to, you know, and I've been wanting to escape that pain all my life. Totally. And I found something that worked momentarily, which the alcohol or the addiction, whatever that is. Uh, it's just such a, it's a really empowering moment for people. It's and, so empowering and it just tears away that, that mm, stigma. That, yeah. That's such something I'm so passionate about is taking away the stigma attached to that word addiction or yeah. addict or alcoholic or whatever the fuck it is. Like, no, we're just all just hurt humans. We're all <laughs> just coping mechanisms, <laughs> working, walking around, butting up against other people's coping mechanisms. And it's amazing we get by. I mean, fuck, yeah. we're amazing, aren't we? We're phenomenal. Humans, are, it's, it's pretty cool to clock some of this behavior. And it's pretty cool the ways in which we do adapt in order to survive. And it's just when we get older that we start to realize that, hey, actually some of these adaptations or survival adaptations have become maladaptive and they don't really serve me anymore and maybe it's time to start peeling back some of these layers and and taking a little bit of a look under the hood so 
yeah, look, I mean, this this is pretty deep seated stuff, and definitely wasn't the sort of kind of conversation I was having at the start of my recovery. But yeah, you know, I started drinking, smoking, was drinking pretty heavily all through my teens, high school, smoking a lot of weed. But yeah, I was always drinking party culture. I played a lot of rugby, so like a lot of footy culture, that sort of lad culture type type experience. But again, like nothing was out of the norm. When things really started to shift for me was when I had, I guess, a long-term young love, like high school, sort of young love, high school sweetheart type experience. I think we were together maybe three, three and a half years. And anyway, long story short, we ended up breaking up. It would have been about 20. And it was just messy. It was messy. It was toxic breakup. It was, you know, two 20-year-olds not having any idea how to deal with heartbreak whatsoever. And for me personally, all I knew how to deal with that that void that I felt within myself was to drink and party and sleep with as many other women as I possibly could. Mm-hmm. And that went downhill real fast, real fast. Yeah, real quick to the point where I was basically, I was living in my car, driving from like beer bottle store to bottle store, just drinking myself into oblivion, passing out on wherever I'd parked up waking up and just copy and paste, repeat. What was it giving you, Drew, the obviously leaning so far into the alcohol and the sleeping around, what was it doing for you? I was just filling the void, numbing the pain, ultimately, mm. just taking away that hurt. That And again, at the time, I wouldn't have even known this. I just knew that I was in so much discomfort physically and emotionally yeah. that I knew or what I did know was that alcohol took that away really quickly just albeit extremely temporarily yeah and for me as well it was like any form of a hangover was absolutely unbearable unbearable so rather than actually get a hangover it was just like let's just keep drinking wow how long did that go on for that cycle Uh, i don't know it was probably a couple of years before i first ended up in rehab for the first time yeah dad found me in my car I'd parked on a street somewhere and the windows rolled down on the car and I just I passed out with the seat back. And so it must have just looked like an abandoned car because all the windows were down and it would have looked like nobody was in it. I think someone on that street must have called the police and just ordered a stolen car or an abandoned car. And my car at that age, I was registered to my dad. So thankfully they called my dad first. I was like, hey, are you missing a car? He's like, no, but I'm fucking missing a son. And so they got the address. Well, he got the address first, thank God. Um, And so he turned up, the cops did, threw me in the car, got me home and sat me down. And they knew what was going on. They just were just waiting. They'd had conversations with friends who had been through these experiences and was excruciating as I'm sure as it was for them. They knew that there was nothing they could do until I wanted to help myself. And they got me home and just, yeah, basically all, all they said was, you know, do you want help? And all I could manage out of my mouth was like yes i don't know what this is i have no idea what this is i don't know anything about addiction alcoholism were you scared drew when all this was happening and could see yourself spinning out of control where was your mindset i don't know if i was scared i was probably more scared of stopping to be completely honest with you i knew that this was going to kill me like i that i wasn't scared of death to be completely honest with you Mm -hmm. but I also like I just didn't know what else there was I didn't I didn't know what the answer was but I knew I needed help I knew I didn't want to die that's what I fucking knew I knew I didn't want to die what was your relationship with yourself like at that point again at that time I probably didn't have a lot of self-awareness but looking back I would have been pretty unsure of myself a lot of my Mm -hmm validation or approval or love or I would seek from outside of myself externally if you had met me you know I was the life of the party I was pretty outgoing I was the funny guy the class clown but again those were all masks that I was just putting on and wearing in order to seek and, and get that, that validation get that approval from others mm. and a lot of my partying was associated with that as well like there was a lot of people that just knew me as like that fucking pisshead or that life of the party or that that, that party and all that dude and again, with that came a persona that, that supported this internal void of like, I'm not enough as I am. But again, at that age, I had no recollection of that, no, no conscious awareness of that, no conscious awareness of that's why I was behaving in the way I was when 
behaving. So yeah, in a long story short, ended up in rehab. Amazing rehab, incredible experience. It was a 12-step based rehab. I remember, like, it was my first experience of ever learning about myself. First experience of sort of counseling and peeling back a few of the layers. And I remember walking out and, like, looking at mum and dad and be like, fuck, mum, like, everyone on this planet could come through rehab and learn something and grow. And you know, everybody on the planet. I think we should all do yeah, it. everyone should go through rehab. But there was also still something in me. Like, I've always questioned everything. I mean, much of the, like, my teachers would hate that, that part of me, but I love that part of me. It's, I've always questioned shit. I've always been really inquisitive. I've always been like, why? Like, cool, yeah, I'll, I, I will do that thing, but why? If you give me a good enough reason, sure. That 12-step adage of, you know, I'd always be asking them why. Why me? Why am I the one sitting here? When, mm-hmm. to be completely honest, like a lot of my friends weren't really drinking much more than me they weren't you really using more drugs than me a lot of them were probably doing more taking more but i was the one that that couldn't stop and so i kept having this question why 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 like why tell me why mm. and all obviously you know the 12 step uh, was the answer was always like you've just got to accept and you've just got a disease for which there's no known cure and i was like fuck i mean you guys are the specialists <laughs> you guys are the ones that are trained in this system and so I'll take your word for gospel. And... Yeah, and that's a hard one too. I, I've, I've got my own opinions. Probably I'm imagining we've got similar opinions on that one. But I just want to go back. So for people listening, when you're in the cycle and you know how you said, Drew, like I said, what was your relationship like with yourself? And you said, obviously, probably not very good, but I wasn't aware of that at the time. It's really handy if you're feeling, if you're listening in or if even you're reflecting on your own drinking and you've been sober for a while, I think it's really good to kind of, look at that and having the awareness of perhaps what's going on for me right now. So you definitely, if you're in it and you're feeling like you're a bit out of control, even if you're not out of control, it might be like, why might I be doing this? Oh, it's imperative. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute, just for people listening, just for a bit of a learning piece here yeah. for people just, yeah, like, okay, what's this thing doing for me? So obviously again, going back to Gabor, but he always says there's something right about it or we wouldn't be doing it in the first place. So what is it doing for me? And then how can I give that to myself without, but just also having the awareness of, okay, I'm doing something, I'm feeling a bit out of control or I'm, I'm needing something. Why might that be? Yeah. Let's unpack that a bit. Yeah. I mean, just to start with, I, I experienced immense levels of, I guess, what people would describe as anxiety. Again, mm. in my childhood, I had no idea that what anxiety was. But looking back, I'd say that that was like physical and somatic responses like a lot of fidgeting, just discomfort, couldn't sit still. Mm-hmm. It was probably deep layers of like, again, if I got put in front of a right specialist, they probably would have told me I had ADHD, all of these things. Real physical, somatic, symptomatic expressions of just just physical discomfort. In my discomfort. Yeah. yeah. And alcohol being the ultimate, you know, fucking muscle relaxant that it is, would have a drink it would just be like oh fuck it just stops it all slows down same with thoughts the thoughts would stop the thoughts would slow down the thoughts are pretty abusive i'd say my inner critic was extremely loud again didn't have the awareness back then but if i took that voice out and sat him down next to me he uh wouldn't he wasn't a nice guy and again i didn't realize the stuff until early recovery i remember one of my first mentors like looking at me and being like drew you really need to start speaking to yourself he may as well have been speaking chinese to me i was like i don't know i like the words wouldn't even resonate that's how deeply ingrained it was in my system to like literally beat myself into submission just to get things done wow and that's such a big piece for people too like that inner critic and sometimes that inner critic's going and we're so used to it michael singer calls it your inner roommate (laughs) we're so used to this guy like giving us a hard time but we give him the boot for sure if that was (laughs) someone you know Lynch, in our space. yeah yeah we say it all the time if you pulled that part of you out and sat him down next to you how much time would you want to spend with yeah, that not person much. not a lot <laughs> yeah so it's good to also look at your thoughts so for people that are in it at the moment or perhaps don't have the awareness to absolutely like have a look at your thoughts like what's going on is the inner critic really is it really loud what's going on there with my 
thoughts that are going on and am I wanting to escape from those things so what is it I'm wanting to escape from also what I heard in your story too like going back to that where you said you just needed mum you needed that unconditional love from mum and then you've had this partnership this relationship that's broken up and and they're also seeking the external validation from people and wanting that love and admiration from people so when that was taken away that's kind of there's a bit of a breakdown in the system you're feeling really unsafe so you so uncomfortable so wanting to drink on that yeah. as well it's a big one for people is it because I've lost something what's the wound in me there if it's because of a breakup okay so what's going on for me there am I not able to love myself enough to get through so I mean there's a big that's been at the right? core of I'd say my uh, most of my journey at least the first three years was learning how to love myself yeah and what that actually meant you know like self loves a bit fluffy and thrown around in a lot of healing spaces these days but yeah i went on a huge journey of like okay what does it actually really truly mean to love myself what does it look like for you for me i believe the purest definition of self love is is deep listening like mm. a really strong deep connection to whatever you deem to be your higher self your authentic self your true self universe god source whatever that is i believe it's all the same energy your intuition that inner guidance system i think higher self is just a real fancy way of saying the part of you that knows the fuck better <laughs> yeah deep listening drew that's beautiful like listening is it to listening to what i might need right now or listening to what yeah that inner just voice is actually to telling the me. other part of me it's kind of the other side of the coin right like the inner critic i do a lot of parts work with, with my clients and to break it down really simply, I break it down like parts work 101. I'll break it down into like, you've got your higher self and you've got the ego. And obviously there's many umbrellas and strings and arms that come out from under the, the ego. But yeah, it's kind of like that whole like devil versus angel on the shoulder. And we've all mm -hmm. got both parts. And it's the relationship we have with both actually that needs to be really, really deeply overhauled. And so first and foremost, actually overhauling the relationship we have with a lot of these different parts that we get really fucking frustrated with. We have a really, we, I say we, um, but I know, and I say we because this comes from my experience and the thousands of other people I've worked with around the world that I feel like I can put a bit of a generalized blanket statement on a lot of this stuff. But from mm -hmm. my experience, a lot of, a lot of us have, quite a combative relationship with varying different adaptations or survival adaptations that have shown up when they're younger. As we're older, they become maladaptive and cause problems, create chaos, create issues. And that can be anything from drinking to people pleasing to that inner criticism that we have towards ourselves. But unfortunately, we usually meet those parts with a lot of hostile energy. Mm -hmm. We meet those parts, you know, we would kind of want to shove them the fuck down and put them in a corner and kind of beat them into submission and, and shut them the fuck up for want of a better word. And so, yeah, where I approached that and what I had to start to learn to do was like, hey, like if that was like this, say that was a three-year-old child, how would you talk to that part of you? Mm -hmm. I'd really hope you wouldn't tell it to shut the fuck up and stick it in a closet. Mm -hmm. I would really hope that maybe you would actually realize and recognize that, that kids don't throw tantrums just to be assholes. They usually just don't know how to communicate in that moment and they're looking to get a particular need then. Mm -hmm. So how can we start to meet some of these parts of us with a much, lot more compassion, a lot more curiosity is a word that I really love. And start mm. to almost kind of befriend some of these parts of us that we've exiled for a very long time or that we've orphaned off or try to cut ourselves away from and start to recognize that they have supported us in some way, shape or form for a very long time. Just it's got to a point where we just now need to build a different relationship with them. And when Absolutely. we start to build a very different relationship with them, we start to realize and recognize that they're actually very open to starting to engage with you in, in very different ways so that's sort of one side of the fence and then yeah i look at it it's building a different relationship with my higher, or building a relationship full stop with my higher self 100 percent. the other thing i was going to say just going back to the parts thing is oftentimes our loudest 
parts are the protector parts. So they're the parts that kind of they've needed to step in to kind of take over and they feel they're very strong. So that might be the part that wants to drink because it wants to protect us or the anger part or and those parts we can tend to feel shame towards. But really they're there for a reason and they've just wanted to help out. So we've got to tell those oh, guys, yeah. hey, it's all right. I'm the adult now. I've yeah. got this and, and working with those parts to kind of say, hey, I see what you're doing. And you've been really helpful up until now. Yeah, and up until now. Now, <laughs> now I need you to kind of. Yeah, and they've been in the driver's seat, right? They're so used to have yeah. been in the driver's seat for so long that yes. just to encourage them to actually take a bit of a back seat can take some work. I was working with a client the other day. Her pattern in relationships is, is like super uncommitted, like the avoidant, one foot in, one foot out, always ready to leave, always ready to, to sort of run or escape or get out of there as soon as it starts mm-hmm. to get a bit serious. Mm-hmm. and we're exploring that part yeah she realized very quickly that that part was created from a very young age because she experienced growing up a lot of unhealthy relationships that her mother was involved in and so relationships will stop just equal not safe and so mm-hmm. when we started to sort of unpack and unwind all of this and, and really start to work with this part it also gave her a deep sense of control and that control created a deep sense of safety and That's so I was beautiful. like, wow. So it's like then noticing in that moment instantly she could be like, actually, thank, thank you. Like, I fucking love you. Thank you for protecting me in the way that you have for so long yeah. and doing your best to keep me safe for so many years. And, you know, it's time we built a different relationship. Yeah, that's beautiful. Did you study IFS, internal family system? Yeah, I've done the layers of, of IFS for sure. I, I weave it in. I feel like it works It works really well in conjunction with us, a lot of somatic-based practices and modalities. Yeah. So for people listening, if you don't know what the fuck we're talking about, there's, <laughs> they're, they're going, what, parts, what, facts, <laughs> you know, We all have many parts. So there's a great book, and I guess the pioneer of the parts work, Internal Family Systems, which we're talking about, is by Dick Schwartz, Richard Schwartz. And he has, if you're interested in what we're talking about, probably just Google Dick Schwartz, Richard Schwartz. There's some great podcasts with him talking about the parts work, but he has a great book called No Bad Parts. And so that's a great one to go and listen to or read. It's great on Audible because you can actually listen and he gives you some exercises to do in kind of recognising your parts and, and then being able to work with them. And then, of course, going and working with someone who's done some like Drew or myself or other therapists that have that specialize in IFS, internal family system. I'm by no means a specialist in it. I have studied it a bit in the Gabor course. Yeah, but it's really great with working with addictions and those big it's, kind it's of It's really good parts. for people, I think, to start with for people that are much mm. more like cognitively orientated or a little bit heady. It's a good segue into a lot of somatic-based modalities like compassion inquiry or somatic experiencing or embodied processing, things like that. So this part of you that wants the kind of the love, the validation, what happens for you in that? And I'm sure it shows up still to this day. I know with me, my parts like that definitely still show up and I've got to kind of notice when they're showing up and starting to take over. What do you do when your parts, your protector parts, let's say this one, when it shows up, when it's seeking validation, when it's wanting validation from externals, Mm. what happens for you? What do you do? How do you calm that part when it shows up? Yeah, it's interesting. It it doesn't show up anywhere near as much as it used to at all, not even close. Very rarely, actually, I would say, in this day and age. And and if it does, it's it's so much more nuanced and so much more Mm. subtle and sneaky. This is a really good example. I was running a retreat recently and, just before a particular practice I was about to run an exercise I was facilitating pretty deep like a a deep experience and I was a bit hesitant as to whether this group was ready for this this exercise or not and I was just really nervous I was noticing how nervous I was and for me that's really uncommon and so for me first and foremost it's clocking what isn't normal in my thought pattern or in my system or clocking what isn't regular. Because that usually shows me that there's a part that's maybe having a little bit of attention or a part that needs a little bit of attention or a part that needs a little bit of recognition. Awesome. And so I was clocked that, and I was lucky I clocked that. I was a couple of hours out, and I was like, fuck, why am I so fucking nervous? And I was like, okay, there's, there's some part of me here that just needs a bit of soothing, a little bit of settling. 
and this is how sneaky it's got in this like where i'm at now as i sat down so i always love i lie on my back for anyone who, who wants an incredible way just to kind of soothe the nervous system reset the nervous system i call it the reboot position lying with your back on the floor and your legs up over a chair or a bed at a right angle that's the fastest mm-hmm. way to move your nervous system from fight and flight into rest and digest and mm-hmm. it's free so i sit myself in in that position and i just close my eyes down and i just tune in and i tune in i sort of i call it holding like a committee meeting i'm like all right team who, who who's here who's showing up who needs a little bit of recognition right now who needs some love who needs a bit of um, a bit of attention and this instance was really funny. Uh, I laugh at this all the time because my little boy came forward first and I could sort of feel this kind of like apprehensive energy to him. He was kind of a little bit withdrawn and I'm like, hey, little dude, like, what's up? What's going on? Is, is this like, is this you? And he wasn't really saying much. And I was like, I kind of clocked it. I'm like, like I call my ego Gary and Gary's a real sneaky and like cheeky little motherfucker. And I'm like, this isn't you, is it? And then all of a sudden, like, Gary comes out behind my little, like, inner child. And he's like, damn it. It's almost like he was trying to, like, push him out in front of him. (laughs) (laughs) He was trying to hide. And I was like, ah, there he is. I was like, hey, Gary, what's up, man? I haven't seen you in a while. Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah, you caught me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you caught me. You figured it out. And I was like, hey, dude. He's like, I'm like what's going on man like what's what's happening and he's like dude i'm scared i'm shit scared like, i'm really nervous i'm like oh thank, like thanks for sharing and i'm like like what what's what, what are you nervous about what, what do you need right now he said like, man like this is a pretty big practice like we haven't done this in person in a long time we haven't blah 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 all these stories coming through i just let him be heard i'm like cool thanks for sharing i'm like well what do you what do you need right now what, what do you need to feel a little bit safer? And he's just like, man, and he's like, honestly, I think I just needed this. Like, I just needed to vent. I needed to rant. And I need to know that you've got me. And you got my back. I'm like, dude, I've seen I've got your back. Hmm. And I was just like, remember, like, this isn't about us. And he's like, because that fear was, wh- how are we going to be perceived? How are we going to be looked? Like, what if this doesn't go right? What if they don't yes. get what we want them to get? What yes. if they don't really go as deep as we want them to go? How yeah. are they going to perceive this experience? And I was like, oh, wow. Haven't seen that mm-hmm. part of me in a while. Mm-hmm. That's really oh, interesting. That's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, for sure. And so I just did what I needed to do just to sort of settle and soothe them. And then all of a sudden that, that whole energy just, just dissipated. And that was like, cool. I was like, this has got nothing to do with me. This is not about me. This is about them and whatever they get from this experience is their experience. So beautiful. Thank you so much. And it just goes to show that our little parts and they also try to sneak in and the protective parts try and come (laughs) into bed. And, you know, it's so beautiful. I love how playful you are towards it and how you're saying to Gary, what's up, man? You know, I see you there. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And that's just part of who I am as well. It's part of my nature and my authentic nature. And so it's meeting that with, with authenticity as much as I can. It takes practice. Oh, absolute practice like that yeah. wasn't something I would have been able to do even probably a couple of years ago, but it's something I encourage a lot of my clients to do is just to start to, I just call it, it's just self-inquiry. You know, I'm not a huge avid journaling fan. If you are, great. If that works for you, cool. I don't teach things I have never done. Same. And so I don't encourage, I mean, like, I'm like, cool, go and give it a go. If that works for you, awesome. My Mm -hmm. process of journaling is just my own practice of what I just call self-inquiry, just taking a minute to slow down, tune in, yeah, just to see where I'm at. I almost have kind of like a conversation with myself. It sounds a little bit weird, but yeah, I'll sit down and just have a chat with myself, have a chat with me, have a chat with my higher self, have a chat with my parts, make sure everyone's looked after and all needs are met and, and carry on. You're like the male version of me. <laughs> yeah. I feel Are you a ginger? I, I'm, no, I'm not full ginger. My beard's a bit fucking ginger. I'm seeing some ginger now. Yeah. Like, you literally, except for the <laughs> New Zealander bit, like, we could be the same person. This is amazing. But I guess the only thing I really wanted to add to that, Danny, was, yeah, just building upon this relationship with your higher self. And if 
again, that's the other side of the coin is this, whatever you want to call it, authentic self, higher self, intuition, universe, just that internal guidance system. Again, when we can start to realize that that is a like deep seated innate superpower that we actually all have access to. And that's when we we also can start to let go of a lot of fear and and just let go full stop and actually realize that we don't have to be in control of everything all the time. We can just kind of surrender and there is a bit of a plan kind of mapped out for us if we just let ourselves follow those nudges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. Follow that calling that, yeah, really lives within us. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And for people listening and thinking, wow, gosh, like – it sounds really full on and the parts work and Gary and, you know, this and that. <laughs> this is probably like myself, Drew, you've been working on this stuff for years and unpacking this with therapists and things like that for years. But really what it comes down to is, and like you said, that listening, that deep listening. So if you're feeling a bit off or if you're feeling like you need something or if the mind's starting to get a bit crazy, you know, it's getting a bit busy there, just checking in, like, and if your, your body's feeling, just listen, okay, what's what's happening right now? What might I need right now? What's actually going on for me in this moment? Am I feeling fearful? Am I feeling sad? Whatever it is that you're feeling and just responding to that that's showing up. And that can be the first step of just starting that conversation with yourself, of just listening and just tuning in. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, I yeah. think thoughts are a byproduct of, the, of feelings. I think a lot of old school healing modalities have it completely backwards and they'll, they'll tell you that thoughts create the feelings. It's, it's becoming much more mainstream and pretty evident that it's the other way around. Yeah, And yeah. that's what I always say to a lot of clients. Like if there's a lot of ruminating thought or there, there feels like a, a particular thought that, that's just cycling, it's like what's what's the feeling that's feeding that? What, what does the body actually need to feel? And again, like you just said, like it took me a long time for these things to all come together. Like, you know, I came out of that rehab, I stayed sober for maybe like nine months, something like that. And then just kind of got back on, picked up where I left off. And at that point in time, I also picked up a pretty heavy Valium addiction. So I think Mm -hmm. that extended out my life of drinking as well, because then I also had a way to kind of self-detox and it probably inhibited me from getting in front of a lot of specialists and support wow. systems than I probably would have otherwise and so yeah ended up in rehab for the second time and I must have been like 2018 2017 and yeah that was just where the switch flipped for me I was like okay I'm done this journey of whatever this is healing recovery whatever word you want to put on it I'm like surely that can't be harder than the life I've created for myself over here and it was kind of this little like choose your hard moment that was where I took really like just something energetically switched in me and threw my line in the sand. I'm like, cool, I'm done. And so I was only exposed to 12 step at that time. That was, that was all I knew. And so that was all I did for maybe a good year. But then, yeah, looked around at a lot of these rooms I was sitting in and I was like, this can't be it. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And I'm not bagging out 12 steps. I think it's phenomenal. I think it's incredible. I think the program at its core is amazing. I think a lot of its core pillars and principles and practices and, and what it's really trying to teach and preach is phenomenal. There are a few pieces of it that I, I really deeply do disagree with. One being the, the disease-based model of addiction and just labeling yourself as an addict or an alcoholic. I, I completely disagree with. I think it's extremely unhealthy. Any words that follow I am are pretty fucking powerful. So yeah, I looked around and I was like, this, this is like, I didn't come this far to just come this far, I guess, was kind of the energy. And I saw people in these rooms with a lot of clean time, but they didn't seem like healthy individuals. <laughs> they didn't seem emotionally healthy, let's call it that. And so yeah, that's where I just started exploring. I ended up working with all sorts of different mentors and teachers and people all around the world. And yes, much like you, you know, found Gabor and everything started to fucking make sense. Not why the addiction, but why the pain. And for me, it was much more of a experiential learning curve for me. It wasn't what I was reading. It was what I was experiencing. I was putting myself into situations. Like my dad died when I was, I think I was 25, 26. And again, just to bury all of that, like did not deal with it at all. And it wasn't until I was in a particular workshop, we were doing this one experience, simple experience that I think a lot of people do in kind of like entry level somatic type based workshops where 
the room got split in half. Half had to close down their eyes and open up their arms to receive a hug. And the other half had to come in and, and give a hug. And you, it was all facilitated, right? And, you know, I was living in my head, like, on, like, 24-7 back in these days as well. And I was sort of just embracing this hug. And I was like, I know it isn't too weird. I'm a pretty huggy guy anyway. And just kind of was sinking into it. And obviously, there's kind of, like, emotion-provoking music in the background. And the facilitator, actually, Preston Smiles, who's joining us on the summit, was just prompting along the way and he said one thing and he said now maybe just imagine as, a, as if this was someone that you wished you could hug and going into this mm. workshop i always had a conscious awareness of either i'm really okay with my dad passing or i've just <laughs> never felt it and never been in a space for that emotion to come through and he mm. said those those words now just imagine this is someone you could hug and it just Ooh. it was like this just Damn, just burst and all mm. this is this absolute grief, sadness, the whole myriad, the wave just started pouring out of me. I was just wailing, sobbing, sobbing. Oh. And again, like I had my process and it was amazing and it was beautiful. You know, I was held in a really loving way. And but on the other side of that, like I felt so much lighter. I felt so much freer in my body. I felt I just felt the space, I felt this peace, I felt this calm. And it was in that moment, I was like, fuck. This is like this epiphany, this light bulb moment. It was like, this, this, this is the problem. It's not the fucking drugs, it's not the drink, it's not the coping mechanism, it's not the vice. This has been my inability to feel in my process, my emotions, my entire life. No one's yeah. shown me this stuff, no one's taught me this stuff. No one's created a safe space for me to express, to feel, to let go, to let the stuff out, to let the stuff move. I just clocked it and I was like, this, th this is the answer. This is what nobody's talking about. This is what nobody's teaching. Everyone's teaching you how to basically just go cold turkey and give you a few tools to like manage not going nearer or closer towards your vice of choice. No one's teaching you how to move what's actually creating that compulsion to escape in the first place. And I was like, fuck, okay. <laughs> this is it i'm following this road this is the track this is the path again like it was a lot of dad stuff to start with on this journey there was i remember doing anger release processes and a lot of it to start with was like fuck you for leaving me dad that energy was very real that energy needed to come up come out again that was part of the grieving process i never went through but again on the other side of that just felt so light felt so free I was like, yeah, wow, this is starting to make sense. And, and again, that temptation to reach out to anything subsided. Anytime I let go of some of the feelings or the emotions that were laying under the surface, and I started just piecing this this puzzle together, I guess. Mm -hmm. Then started to just a lot of Gabor's work, um, Peter Levine, the best of Vandenberg, all of these trauma-based, somatic-based, body-orientated therapist. And I was like, wow, this is at the core of everything. It, it's this inability to feel and process our emotion. And when that penny dropped, I was just like, okay, cool. How far and wide can I spread this message? Because yeah. some of the messages yeah. that are getting spread are completely just inconducive to, to the level of healing that people really deserve and require. And so, yeah, just went down that train and haven't stopped yeah it's so and once you get the taste I think once you start to discover that world and you start to see it having an impact on your own self I know this was the case with me it just is like an unquenchable thirst almost it's just like wanting more and more of this knowledge so just to go back there and drew some of the the, the people that we're talking about here some of these mentors and, and mine are exactly the same it's Gabor Mate, Bessel van der Kolk, Peter Levine, Dan Siegel is one for me I don't know if you've gone into him and then of course Dick Schwartz, Richard Schwartz. So they're people. Now you mentioned put, Michael Singer as well. I love Michael Singer. Oh, Michael Singer. Singer. I love him. He's my spiritual <laughs> coach. Uh, I love him so much. I don't really go a day without listening to something for, yeah. or reading something from Michael Singer. So they're just some great people to dive into. And some of that work can seem really mm. full on, really heady. Not heady in, is though as when you're reading the books, it's like, well, this is a lot to digest. I know when some people start to read The Body Keeps the Score by Saul van der Kolk, it can actually bring up a lot of... So deep, such a good... I recommend to anyone who's just starting and, and to like dip their toe in a lot of any work, whatever it is, 
I really love a lot of Nicola Perra's work. The Holistic yeah, Psychologist. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, a lot of yeah. her books are amazing, and they're very easy to understand and follow and clock. Yes, what can she's be quite difficult and comprehensive and sometimes clinical to understand. I love her most recent book. I really believe that attachment and those attachment adaptations that can be created from from childhood, which is basically the core of her new book, is understanding a lot of our relational behaviour. Is that the workbook one? No, it's the newest one. Yeah, How to Be the Love You Seek. Right, I haven't read that one. We'll put links to that in the show notes. Okay, so also really excited. I feel really honoured to be asked to be one of the speakers in this amazing online summit that you're putting together of great speakers. And talk to us a bit about this summit that you've put together through the Addiction Collective and what that's going to look like. And also just wanted to say, that it starts this Friday, which will be, what's the date, Drew? Uh, Great question. Uh, It starts on the 2nd, Friday the 2nd, if you're in Australia, uh, or it'll be Thursday the 1st if you're in the States. Great. So if you're listening to this podcast after the fact, Drew, what's going to happen there? Still go through to the website. You'll be able to buy all of the recordings for a very, very, very low price, like $17, something like that. You can get access to all of the recordings. We've got 43, 44 speakers, I believe, from all around the world contributing to the space over three days. We've got three different stages running at a time. So I think we've got about you know, 13 to 15 talks a day this was just an idea that came through in meditation maybe seven months ago. I was just sitting there one day and I, I'm probably much like you. I get a lot of people reaching out, looking to collaborate. You know, how can we help more people? How can we support those that need it the most? What can we do? And yeah, it came through really clear. It was like, again, that listening, right? That higher self, that part of me, which is like, mm. let's just bring everyone together. Let's bring everyone together. Let's go. And so, yeah, this is really created for those that are in it, those that are really struggling right now, those that really don't know where to turn, those that are, are confused. You know, this, this space can be a bit confusing. And not, not just that, but those that are already in some form of recovery or healing journey and just want to take their, thing, their, their journey to the next level and want to come and learn from some experts in the field, but not just experts. But, you know, I'd say... I think every single speaker that we have sharing in this space comes from some form of lived experience. So they're not just speaking from a fucking textbook. They're speaking from a place of embodiment. They're speaking from a place of I've walked in your shoes. And we want to make this as raw, real and fun as we possibly can. There's a lot of these kind of summits and conferences and things like that that are created and unfortunately they're more predominantly targeted towards the practitioner or the therapist like us and they're fucking snore fests like excuse the language but they are like they're, they're <laughs> boring as shit <laughs> they might be exciting for someone like you and i but you know for someone who's just starting this journey like so much of what they would be sharing i would have gone over my head six seven years ago we want to make this just as accessible to people as possible and as relatable to people as possible Yeah, it's going to be phenomenal. We've already got, I think, nearly 1,500 attendees registered, signed up, ready to rumble. Amazing. And yeah, as I said, if you do listen to this before the second, it's free. It's free to register. It's free to to tune in. Um, If it is after the fact, yeah, it would be a small fee. It'd be like 70 bucks, something like that. You'll get access to all the recordings. So jump in tune in obviously you can tune into danny you'll tune in to people like myself we've got some incredible incredible speakers from all around the globe and just super tangible tools you know i think this journey is so different for everybody you know Mm -hmm. what's worked for me might not work for the next person what's worked for you might not work for the next person but hey it's like here's a buffet or a smorgasbord of recovery of different journeys of sobriety of addiction of whatever you want to call it Come and cherry pick what works for you and put it into your own little blueprint and walk away with a system that that feels really supportive for yourself. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. I love it, Drew. That's so fantastic. So if someone wants to sign up, we'll put links in the show notes and obviously there'll be stuff going up on our all of the different speakers, social media platforms as well. But here for people listening, how do you go ahead and sign up? Head straight to www 
dot theaddictioncollective.com. Beautiful. All right. That sounds great. So I'm very much looking forward to being part of this and thank you so much. And thank you for coming on today. I love your work. We're just so aligned in what we do. And I think it's, it's awesome to share this kind of knowledge. And if you feel like anything that we've spoken about today resonates, please reach out to myself or to Drew and, you know, also just come and check out this collective of amazing people that are going to be sharing their knowledge, their lived experience. And maybe just maybe you'll hear something in there that's going to resonate and we'll help you on your journey. That's what we're here for. It's just great to be able to share. Incredible. Thank you so much for having me, Danny. Appreciate it. Drew Wild, what a legend. Thanks, mate. <laughs> See you, love. See you.